We're starting in on muscle physiology, and this concept is going to be probably one of the more challenging physiology concepts. Yeah. But it's challenging, but it's very doable. We're just going to tell ourselves a story. We're going to learn the names of all of the players, and we're going to see what they do. And that's how you're going to learn the physiology of muscle contraction. Um, and aside from the physiology of contraction, there's lots of other details. Properties of muscle tissue, characteristics, uh, skeletal, and recall that we have not just skeletal muscle. Skeletal muscle is the focus of this unit, but you do, remember, have cardiac and smooth muscle. Just like with bone, we'll talk about the naming conventions of skeletal muscle. Once again, the people who named these features, the people who named these muscles, were not incredibly smart people. They just named them all the thing that goes from the thing to the thingy. And I'm not really exaggerating about that. Or the thing that does this thing, or the thing that looks kind of like a triangle. Like, that's really what these names mean. They just look long and fancy because they're in a different language. We'll talk about the effect of exercise on skeletal muscle. Um, organization is another big topic. Aside from the topic of skeletal muscle contraction physiology, the way it's organized, there's some dense vocabulary in there. Again, if you're using your medical terminology book, then that will make a lot more sense. You can make some of it be intuitive. So hopefully we already recall that you have skeletal, cardiac, and smooth muscle, and histologically they have slightly different appearances. There are very, very, very many skeletal muscles, and by comparison, our list is very, very short. We do not have 700 muscles to learn for your, first, for your next lab practical. It's, I think, three pages instead. Much, much more manageable. Each one has a name. Each one has a name. It has an origin. It has an insertion, which origin and insertion are attachment sites to bone. And they all have innervations. You're not even responsible for any innervations. I've known massage therapists who were responsible for name, origin, insertion, action, and innervation for 500 plus muscles. So again, I'm going to remind you that there are going to be massage therapists who are better educated than you are about this before you complain about that list that I gave you. This is a short one. So muscles have four main properties, excitability, and specifically, this is electrical excitability. There is electricity in the human body. It's not the same exact way that electricity behaves in the wires in your entertainment system, but it's still electricity because it's the movement of electrons. And most of you haven't had chemistry yet, so I can't really talk in detail about ions and electricity just yet, but that concept is about to come into play. So we'll, we'll do what we can to understand the electrical uh, activity that's happening within nerves and muscles. Contractility means that they can shorten. The muscle is going to shorten in length and that's going to be a contraction. Now these two terms right here you have to be very careful with. Elasticity versus extensibility. You can't just think of elasticity as an elastic band. The first part of moving an elastic band is stretching it, right? That's actually going to be defined in here as extensibility. So the part where you're stretching it, that's extensibility. The fact that it can recoil, that it comes back to its original resting shape, that's our definition of elasticity. So elasticity is returning to resting length when applied tension is removed. The part where it stretches out in the first place, that is now extensibility. So this is kind of an operational definition specific to muscle tissue. Does that make sense for everyone, the difference? All right, if I'm stretching it out, what property is that? Extensibility. extensibility. And then when it comes back to resting, that's elasticity. Excellent, thank you. So each skeletal muscle is considered an organ, which means we all just have so many organs, like 700 plus organs, it's a lot of organs, uh, because they all, they contain all four tissue types. They have epithelial tissue, they have nervous tissue because they are innervated, they have um, muscle tissue, obviously, and they definitely have connective tissue associated with them as well. 
skeletal muscle is striated and we're going to find out exactly how it takes on that striated appearance today at the microscopic level. And generally their attachment sites are on bones. And it says the word usually here, it's qualified because in some rare cases, and I don't think any of your muscles have these features, um, sometimes they attach onto tendons of other muscles. It's, it's not as common an arrangement as going from a bony feature to another bony feature. So functions of skeletal muscle, they're going to help you move. They're going to maintain your posture. They're going to help you regulate temperature. Shivering is a function of uh, muscle contraction. Storage and movement of materials and support, of course. All right, here's our first organizational slide for your skeletal muscle. This slide and this slide are giving you more or less the same uh, content. And you're going to have to get a lot of vocab off of these slides and be able to define it. And usually at this point, I will draw a sort of uh, logistical thing up here as well. So it's going to be hard for me to do both. Lecture with a computer and right up here. have the muscle itself and that muscle is going to be surrounded you know I'm not even going to do that surrounding tissue just yet uh, your muscle itself no I will is surrounded by something called epimydium epimydium what's uh, epi mean around or above and then my is muscle so surrounding the muscle entirely you're going to have a membranous sheath known as the epimysium now that muscle is a bundle of several muscle fascicles does anybody know what the term fascicle comes from. It actually shares a root word with the term fascist. Does anybody know what fascism was supposed to mean before it turned into what it actually became? It's an interesting concept and they're actually related. That, I'm not just bringing fascism up randomly. So the idea of fascism is that together we are strong. But what fascia, or what a fascicle actually is, is a bundle of sticks. So it's really easy to break a single stick, but it's hard to break an entire bundle of sticks together. So that's what a fascicle is, and that was what fascism was supposed to represent as well. Obviously, it didn't work out that way. So there's fascicles, several fascicles together is the muscle itself. Around that fascicle is a perimysium. That fascicle is going to be a bundle of several muscle fibers. Here's the muscle fiber. And that's going to be surrounded by endomysium. So it really, if that part's kind of intuitive, or you can make this intuitive, endomysium, paramysium, epimysium. You know it has to do with muscle, and you know it's going to be the deeper, the middle, and the most superficial layer. So you just kind of have to reverse engineer it from there. Now, when I say muscle fiber, this is actually synonymous with the muscle cell. And I'm going to repeat that. The muscle fiber is synonymous with the muscle cell. So this is a cell we're talking about with all of the features that we're already familiar with in terms of cells. It's going to have a plasma membrane. It's going to have endoplasmic reticulum. It's going to have a cytoskeleton. 
we're actually going to have some new terminology for those things, but really all we're talking about is a very, very special arrangement of those cellular features that already exist. So in the case of a muscle cell or a myofiber, a muscle fiber, I forgot what I was going to. Oh, we're talking about a very long cylindrical cell. So again, cells are absolutely microscopic, right? But we can actually have them be very lengthy. We can have a cell running the entire length of a muscle. So here to here, that's one cell. Now we're going to keep going. Myofibers. Zoom in on this are made of myofibrils. We keep going down logistically. Myofibril. Now we're done with the mysiums. We don't have any more mysiums. We don't have anything deeper than the endomysium surrounding the muscle cell. You have myofibrils that are composed of myofilaments. And this is modified cytoskeleton. We'll see this in more detail in a bit. Skeleton. Now you can also structurally arrange that muscle fiber, really. You can arrange it into myofilaments. You could also arrange it into the contractile unit known as a sarcomere. We're going to see the word sarco in just a second. Does anybody know what the root word sarco means? It actually means flesh. So we're going to see the word sarco in relation to a lot of things here. A sarcomere is the contractile unit of the muscle cell. So the muscle cell is going to be uh, separated not just longitudinally into these units of your cytoskeleton, but also in a transverse way or a, a cutting it lengthwise into sarcomeres. You're going to have a repeating pattern of cytoskeleton, each of which is going to independently contract all the way down this muscle, and each of those is called a sarcomere. So this is what I mean by we're very dense in terms of our terminology today. Now, people at home can listen to this on repeat, but I think what we're going to do now is I'm going to pause it, and we'll go backwards and forwards through this a couple of times until we feel comfortable with it. Sound good? So one more time backwards, myofilaments are going to be arranged into myofibrils. Myofibrils are going to be arranged into myofibers. Myofibers are going to be surrounded by endomysium. Groups of myofibers are going to be bound into fascicles, which will be surrounded by paramysium. Groups of fascicles will be bound together into skeletal muscles, which will be surrounded by epimysium. So again, a muscle cell is a muscle fiber. I don't want you to ever forget that we are talking about a very specialized cell, but it's still a cell with all of our cellular components. Here's a logistical arrangement of those connective tissue sheaths, as well as the purpose of those connective tissue sheaths. The entire skeletal muscle, again, surrounded by epimysium, fascicles surrounded by paramysium, and individual cells, skeletal muscle fibers, surrounded by endomysium. So I do really like this logistical image uh, for just the connective tissue components as compared to trying to shove them onto this image as well. Now the purpose for that connective tissue, by and large, is to distribute blood vessels and nerves. It's also going to be part of the attachment system, the way we get the muscle to that skeleton. So maybe you remember from skeletal system, we have that periosteum. Now we've got a perimysium, we had a periosteum already. Same naming convention. So it's really not that those skeletal muscle cells are going onto those bone cells. 
so much as it's connective tissue onto connective tissue. That epimysium additionally is going to keep muscles separated from each other. The deep fascia separates muscles from another muscle or part of a muscle. And the superficial fascia separates muscle from skin. And again, fascia is going to be a general word for connective tissue. We're going to find connective tissue throughout the body. If you, when you, we dissect skeletal muscle, which we're going to do with our fetal pigs, we will have, I believe next week, we'll probably want to do that dissection of the fetal pigs just for their superficial muscles. You will find that you can sort of peel those muscles apart and you can find this connective tissue in between. It looks kind of cobwebby, kind of like a cobweb. And that's going to be the, the deep and superficial fascia separating those muscles from skin and muscles from each other. That's the stuff you dissect out when you're trying to visualize individual muscles. Now there's going to be a difference between tendons and ligaments, which we've already seen. A tendon does what? Tends to muscle and bone, excellent. Whereas a ligament, bone to bone, links bone to bone. Good, so a tendon connects muscle to bone. All of your muscles are going to uh, gradually transition into tendon and that tendon is going to be what attaches onto that uh, bone. So usually they're cord-like in appearance. If you take out, for example, the biceps brachii muscle, you'll see an elongated cord-like tendon attaching to that radius. But we also have a modified flat sheet of tendon in a couple of different locations. And I've heard this pronounced a couple of different ways. Uh, I'm a fan of aponeurosis. I've also heard instructors call it aponeurosis, which, whichever, do whichever you want. It just means there's a broad tendon and they're always named for their location. So this would be the abdominal aponeurosis. On the posterior part of the trunk, you're gonna have a thoracolumbar aponeurosis. On your cranium, you're gonna have an occipital frontal aponeurosis. So it's just where it is. And that's really all there is to that concept. Broad, flat tendon associated with a number of different muscles usually and named after its location. You've already heard me using the terms origin, insertion, and action. So what that means is that for every muscle, there's going to be multiple, multiple places where it attaches. The origin is generally defined as the attachment site on the less movable joint, the part that's not moving in response to muscle contraction. And the insertion is considered the attachment site that crosses the joint that does move in response to muscle contraction. So when you contract your biceps brachii muscle, what we say the action is, is flexion of the arm at the elbow. That's its main action. Therefore, its origin is going to be this one, and its insertion is crossing the joint that actually decreases that angle during flexion. Does that make sense for everyone? I'm getting really neutral responses on that one. So, origin is less movable, action is more, or sorry, insertion is more movable. Actually, the biceps brachii is a terrible example for this because it does cross two different joints which is not always the case, because it actually does help you like this a little bit. Correct. And insertion is the more movable joint. Origin is near the less movable joint in general. There's a typical pattern that you can usually count on, especially in the appendicular skeleton, where the insertion is going to be distal and the origin is going to be proximal but that's not the best definition for it. You can usually rely on that though. Origin would be proximal. Insertion would be distal, typically. 
for some muscles, they're more square shaped and they have like lateral and medial attachment sites. So it's not always going to work. And others like uh, pectoralis minor has both attachments that are fairly movable. So it's kind of debatable in a gray area. But for the most part, you're not going to have to deal with any of those gray area muscles. All right, any questions before I move on to the next really, really vocab dense part of this lecture? The vocab's just going to keep flying at your face today. I'm not going to lie. Okay. Now, I mentioned that sarco means flesh. And very, very frequently, you're going to see the term sarco associated with your muscles. You've already learned your basic cell structures, your endoplasmic reticulum, your cytoplasm, your plasma membrane. Because muscle cells are so very, very specialized, they, the scientists, for whatever reason, decided that we should name these common things that are common to every uh, cell something special just for muscles. So instead of a plasma membrane, we're now going to call that the sarcolemma. It's just the plasma membrane of a muscle cell. We're going to call it a sarcolemma now. Instead of cytoplasm, which was all of that stuff, including organelles and fluid, now we're just going to call it sarcoplasm. And smooth endoplasmic reticulum is very, very specialized in muscle cell. It's actually going to have a very important function aside from metabolism in your muscles. So now we're going to call it sarcoplasmic reticulum instead of endoplasmic reticulum. Let's not worry about the word matrix right now. Yeah. That's okay. You have even further specializations of sarcolemma. So again, sarcolemma being your plasma membrane. You have special tubes derived from your plasma membrane, your sarcolemma, that we're going to call transverse tubules. And you're going to have specialized pouches based on sarcoplasmic reticulum called terminal cisternae. So you're going to want to kind of consider that those terminal cisternae a part of the sarcoplasmic reticulum. We're going to think of it as a sort of pouch. It's going to hold something important for us. And you're going to have this arrangement of transverse tubules, T-tubules, associated with a terminal cisternae, a blind pouch, on either side of them. So it's going to be two terminal cisternae, one T-tubule. That's going to give you a triad. That arrangement together is going to give us a triad. And there's a reason for this arrangement. It's going to help us distribute things. It's going to help us communicate along the entire length of the cell. So when something happens here, it's going to go all the way down in this portion. When something happens here, it's going to communicate all the way down this portion, all the way down the length of the muscle cell. You've already seen myofibrils. You know that they are cylindrical and that they can be separated into two, uh, two directions, right? You have the contractile unit known as the sarcomere, and these are made out of myofilaments derived from cytoskeleton. So we're back in what should be familiar terminology here. Those myofilaments are categorized as thick and thin, or we can start, say, be very specific about it and call it myosin and actin. Myosin is thick, actin is thin, each of these is a myofilament, and that is going to be the one thing you definitely know by the end of today, because we're going to listen to a mediocre rap about it. Um, it's going to be a very clinically accurate rap, but you're only going to catch the myosin is thick, actin is thin part of it today. That's probably how that's going to work out. 
big picture, the way contraction is going to work is that there are these things on myosin called myosin heads. And they're attached to necks that are attached to this part, this myofilament, this part of the cytoskeleton. And those heads can bend. Those heads are going to attach to the thin filaments. And when those heads necks bend, that thin filament is going to move. That's going to be our very, very big picture, how muscles contract, how these things shorten, how sarcomeres shorten, is that myosin heads bend and pull on thin filaments, actin filaments. Right now I'm just loading you up on the vocab because when we get to the physiological process, we're going to need to use all of the vocabulary to explain what's actually going on. So again, thick filaments are made of myosin, including myosin heads. When those myosin heads bind to the thin actin filaments, we call that a cross bridge. They're connected to each other like this. It's bridged across, it's a cross bridge. Uh, thin filament is made of actin. And two more very important vocab words for you here. There's going to be other proteins associated with actin. Troponin, or troponin, depending on who you ask. And tropomyosin. Tropomyosin is thread-like. It's going to wrap around the actin filament. Troponin is a more, I don't really want to say spherical, but I'm going to say spherical protein that is associated with the tropomyosin thread-like structure. Do you have a question? So troponin, wait for it, are we ready for this next bit? It just keeps coming. It's not going to slow down. Troponin has a binding site for calcium. We're going to care long term for the rest of your careers. You're going to care about calcium. Troponin has a binding site for calcium. Now let's zoom back out for just a second. Here's a pretty good image of a sarcomere. Here's another good image of a sarcomere. Just two different visual ways of representing the same information. You have thick filaments arranged here along the midline. And you have thin filaments that are attached to the ends of the sarcomere. Those ends we're going to call Z-discs. The protein is kind of a zigzag Z shape which is better represented here. So again, along that midline, which we'll call the M line, you have your thick filament arrangement. And along the ends of the sarcomeres attached to Z discs, you have your thin filaments. Your thick filaments are made of myosin. They have the heads that can bend. Your thin filaments are made of actin. They have the binding sites for calcium on the troponin and that thread-like tropomyosin associated with them. So again, big picture, when this contracts, these thin filaments are going to be pulled towards the M line. So it's going to go like this, towards the M line. That thick filament actually stays stationary, and those heads pulling on the thin filaments move it towards the M line. So what you end up with is a shortening of the entire sarcomere. That Z disc moves closer to the M line and the sarcomere shortens. It means the segment of the muscle cell is shortening. And that's going to happen in a coordinated fashion throughout the muscle. I know this is not making any sense right now. Is, is that what you guys are feeling like right now? Not. Yes, okay, I know it doesn't make any sense. It's going to make sense when I've said it about five different times. It's going to make sense when you've heard three different online videos talking about it. That's when it's going to make sense. Okay, 
What we call all of this is sliding filament theory. And if I go zoom back and forth between these, we're going to have a relaxed muscle. It's going to receive an impulse to contract, and it's going to be a contracted muscle. Relaxed muscle, contracted muscle. Relaxed muscle, contracted muscle. So note that you have this shortening of the sarcomere, this M line. The Z disc is closer to the M line. We call this space from actin to actin the H zone. The H zone is now shortened. Histologically, there's actually going to be a difference in appearance between relaxed versus contracted muscle. I'm not going to hold you to the histology on this one. I don't make you, I don't hold you to every single one of these terms. I do hold you to Z disc and M line. And that's kind of a personal decision where I don't really understand why we call that the H zone um, or the A band. It doesn't really make any intuitive sense. I feel like they were just throwing alphabet letters at a board when they did that. Now the only way that this happens, this contraction will occur, is in the presence of a neural impulse. You need nerves to fire onto muscles. And when nerves fire onto muscles, that sends an electrical signal. Now again, I'm going to go straight through this. After I go through this, we're going to pause. We're going to deal with it for a little bit more. You're going to go on lunch in just a bit. You're going to have all of your lunch period to sort of integrate this information. And we're going to work with it for the rest of the day until it makes sense. When a neuron fires, there's some anatomy associated with the end of the neuron and the place that it uh, reaches the muscle in this case. Your textbook likes the word synaptic knob. I'm a neuroscientist. I hate that term. Um, there's like five different terms from this one. I like axon terminal personally, but that's a personal decision. You can say synaptic knob if you want to say synaptic knob. I like axon terminal. It's the terminal. It's the end of the axon. That's all. And in the axon terminal, the end of the axon, you have synaptic vesicles. And it, because you remember cell biology so well, that you know a vesicle contains a substance. And a vesicle is something that you can uh, use for exocytosis, right? Sound familiar? From the way, way back when before, from the before time? Those synaptic vesicles are going to contain neurotransmitters. And this is your first ever neurotransmitter. I'd like you all to meet acetylcholine. He's going to be your friend. Hello, acetylcholine. It is always acceptable to write acronyms for neurotransmitters and hormones. So if you want to write ACH, you can write ACH. That is an accepted medical neuroscience endocrinology term. That's all cool. Synaptic vesicles contain acetylcholine. When the neuron fires, those synaptic vesicles, which contain acetylcholine, will undergo exocytosis, and that acetylcholine is going to end up in the synaptic cleft, in the synapse, in the space between the neuron and the muscle cell. This connection between the neuron and the muscle is called, or actually specifically this part of the muscle associated with the neuron is called the motor end plate. That motor end plate is going to be very foldy. What's our purpose of having folds? Surface area. It's always surface area. In this case, that's surface area for receptors for acetylcholine, acetylcholine receptors. So when acetylcholine diffuses over to the acetylcholine receptors, that's going to send a signal to the muscle that it's time for it to contract. 
So specifically that muscle cell will be contracted in response to this neuron releasing acetylcholine. Here's another illustration of the neuromuscular junction, the junction between the neuron and the muscle cell. And here's how that looks histologically. You're going to have a darkly stained neuron and it's going to have this axon terminal or what they call the synaptic knob directly adhered to the surface, the sarcolemma, the surface of that cell. So the neuron fires and that sends a signal down a T-tubule. That T-tubule receiving that electrical signal is going to trigger the release of calcium from the terminal cisternae. Calcium leaks out of terminal cisternae and into the sarcoplasm. Calcium is going to bind to troponin now that it's loose in the sarcoplasm. The binding of calcium to troponin causes that thread-like tropomyosin to move over that actin. And in doing so, it's going to uncover binding sites, active, active sites. Those binding sites are for myosin heads. As long as you have calcium and ATP, adenosine triphosphate, that myosin head is going to attach to the actin, bend its neck, and then detach, and then it's going to do it again, as long as you have those two substances around. So again, it's attach, pivot, detach, attach, pivot, detach, attach, pivot, detach. And every time it does that, the myosin is stable, the actin got pulled towards that midline. And that's where I want to stop.